I think this might be the time, Sam, to pivot towards where the top four is in this draft class right now. Yeah, so I want to I want to jump into one of those guys next because I think that I think it's important to talk first about the Thompson twins and sure. where they fit within this, sure. and then go to like the top five because I think the top five is really interesting. So the Thompson twins, Amon and Asor Thompson, are currently with Overtime Elite, which is a new program. This is the second year where scouts and evaluators have had to go down to Atlanta and really get a feel for what that quality of competition looks like. The players there are better this year. Robert Dillingham is there. Cannon Carlisle is there this year. There is more talent surrounding the Thompson Twins that they get to compete against every week. However, this is a new organization. Those games, for people that have watched them, are often transition fests let's call them that as a more more positive spin on what they can often be a lot of these games end up not being particularly applicable oftentimes to nba scouting and some of the things that teams want to see from them in terms of half court decision making you know defensive iq as a half court player Those are the things that matter in the playoffs, execution, the ability to process things. Those are the things that you really want to see. So Amin and Asura Thompson are in an interesting position where teams have gone down to see them. And I'm sure you've talked to NBA teams. The feedback is more polarizing than what the consensus seems to be where myself, you, you know, John Gavoni, Jeremy Wu, whoever, has Amen at number three or number four, has a sore somewhere seven to ten. You kind of get it all over the map from NBA teams, in part because of the situation they're within. So I will ask you this. What has been your overall feel for how this season has gone for Amen and Asor Thompson in overtime elite? Yeah, there. It's such a complicated question, and it's one that I'll do my best to try to give a succinct answer to. So, I think that there are two ways to break down the the season that they've had thus far. One is through the obvious need that both Amen and Asor have to continue to develop their game to make them NBA ready. And when we say develop their game, I think the thing we're looking forward to most is seeing if they can add a jump shot. When we first started doing some of these podcasts together back in August, that was what we talked about as the swing skill for Amen and Asore Thompson. Six foot seven, six foot eight, long, lanky athletes, just physical freaks with their ability to separate with a great first step, to finish above the rim, all the natural tools to be high impact defenders. They have good vision, they have decent handles, and the ability to just make really good plays as, as passers when they drive towards the lane. But the jump shot is what was missing, the ability to score and kind of create their own. And this year has not shown a ton of progress for either. There have been some slight tweaks and slight improvements made for a sore. I think that a man is starting to shoot them more and definitely continues to put in the work, but it hasn't translated over to results just yet. Uh, But that's a disappointment. From an evaluation standpoint, we want to see if these guys can become top options in the NBA who deserve to operate with the ball in their hands. And in order to be able to do that, I think a pull-up jumper is necessary as well as the ability to just consistently stretch the floor from three-point range. And neither guy is in that area right now. Well, for me, as much as anything, it's not even just the shooting. It's how do they score if they aren't at the basket? I think Asar has a little bit more in that regard. I think he's a little bit more uh, polished in terms of his footwork, he'll throw up those like weird little hook shots a little bit more often around the basket when he's driving. Like he'll, he he has a little bit more, just a little bit more craft in terms of the way he's attacking. Asor is so explosive that arguably he doesn't need as much craft, right? Or uh, Amen, I'm sorry, is a little bit more explosive that he doesn't need as much craft, right? Amen and Asor don't really have any in-between game right now either. Like the thing that almost 
would transform Amon's game more than the shooting is the floater. Like if he could add like a little floater from seven to 12 feet, it would be enormous for his evaluation. It, it would almost like completely change things for him, I think, as a prospect, because he is so explosive that NBA teams aren't going to be able to stay in front of him. He, he is so quick. He has that first step that is unbelievable. Out in transition, like I talked about the fact that those uh, OTE games become more transition fests from an evaluation perspective. I often struggle to make a decision on if they are often transition fests because the Thompson twins are so athletic, they really can push the pace, push the tempo, dictate that speed of play in a way that other teams in OTE can't just straight up. So it's interesting to try and figure out and determine where exactly they settle. End of the day, I'm in Thompson is the highest upside guy in this draft outside of the top two, I think. If it works, it's really going to work. And you and I, like, we have defensive questions about them a little bit. Asar has a chance to be, like, a great weak side rim protector, a great team defender. He's a really, really high-level athlete as well. Like, Mm -hmm. Amon's going to enter the league as one of the five best athletes in the NBA, point blank. And if you think I'm exaggerating, wait until you see him. Asar is going to be what? Like, a top seven or eight percent athlete in the nba so like a top top 30 athlete in the nba he's that athletic that's not he's a genuine like maybe not elite elite level athlete but great extremely high level athlete so we're gonna see a lot of this pan out and dictate over the course of the the pre-draft process as much as anything i think nba teams are going to be really interested to see the Thompson twins outside of the OTE structure and see them in their own gyms for workouts. And the last thing I will note on the Thompson twins and why I tend to buy into them still, I think a little bit more than some NBA teams do. There are NBA teams that are very high on them. I don't, don't, and NBA evaluators that are very high on them. When I say they're polarizing, I mean, genuinely like there are teams that absolutely think they are incredibly talented and love them, there are also teams that worry a lot more about their flaws right now than others. They are superb workers, yeah. and they are hyper competitors. Like, they, they really, really are the kind of players that I trust and buy into getting better over time. And they take constructive criticism as well. For people that want to go back and watch the tape watch along I did with the Thompson twins. We discussed the shooting. They know, and they will attack it and they will come at you and say, look, we know we have to get better at this. They're not people who just shut down when that happens. They want to hear it. They want to have that understanding of what they have to do to get better. So I believe in the Thompson twins. I will say it's no luck that they go in the top three in the top five. Like, I think they, I think Amon probably ends up in the top five, but it, it is, it's a little bit more open and it will be very dependent upon where teams fall when the lottery rolls around. Yeah. I don't know if you meant to give that pun there when you said that you thought that the Thompson twins would get better over time. Cause that was, that was an elite pun that you kind of gave right there. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I totally agree with all that stuff. I think the point that you made that rings true to me is trying to figure out if the Thompson twins are a product of the environment for how much they play in transition or the cause of of their team being able to play in transition so much. And I I did a deep dive about a week or so ago into the numbers behind this. Your general average NBA team probably plays about 16 to 17% of the time in transition, according to Synergy Sports, that those are the amount of possessions that end in transition. And the overtime elite program with City Reapers, the team that Amen and Asor play on, they're over 30%, almost double that amount. So it is laughable how much this just turns into like a track meet with them using their athleticism, their instincts. They gamble a lot on defense and they can get away with it. But when you talk about the half court evaluation, that's what matters in playoff time. That's what's going to matter if games on the line in a a clutch postseason series – 
can a man, can a sore really break down a defense in the half court? And I think that we've seen a little bit more of red flags start to pop up about whether it's finishing ability, separation, driving into traffic. Like, look, the way the teams defend them in that OTE program, as soon as they start to drive it, they send three to the lane and try to collapse yep. on them. That's not yep. necessarily going to happen in the NBA, and teams can't get away with doing that. But it certainly does reveal some of the challenges like we talked about, about the in-between game that just hasn't developed. I think there's still a lot left to really refine for these guys and how they're going to impact on the offensive end of the floor, as well as some challenges mechanically that they need to sort through on defense. So really high upside, ridiculously good kids with high work ethic, but they're going to be still fairly raw when they when they come into the league. And I think that that's an underrated aspect of trying to evaluate where they stack up next to other guys in this class. Last question on the Thompsons for now. Where do you have them ranked at this point? So I just made an adjustment this past weekend and moved a men from the three spot to number four, uh, just from watching a little bit of play here from, uh, that we can talk about him later, but Brandon Miller from Alabama has surpassed him for that spot. For me, I have a sore at 13. I'm a little bit lower okay. than most people are on a sore, but I have them at four for a men and 13 for a sore. 